Ah, spring, the time of allergies and amazing new Compute Module 4 boards. Today, we'll see the Raspberry Pad 5, a new touchscreen controller for 3D printing, Seed Studio's Reterminal, a powerful HMI device, WaveShare's dual Ethernet 4G 5G board, which I'm going to build a router with, the RPi4 RTC PoE, which is the most densely packed DIN rail computer I've ever seen, and more. Keep watching to the end and you'll find pollen isn't the only thing in abundance right now. New Pi boards are everywhere. Unfortunately, the compute models that make them go are still a bit hard to find. Keep refreshing rpilocator.com to find one in stock and let's dive right in. Kicking things off is the Raspberry Pad 5. This is a 5-inch IPS touchscreen display that runs straight off a Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4, and it costs 99 bucks. There are other 5-inch and 7-inch displays for Raspberry Pis, but the Compute Module completely changes the game here. You don't need funky HDMI adapters or mounting brackets and space for a giant Pi 4 Model B. You just pop the Compute Module on the back, and the whole thing is only a little thicker than the Ethernet jack. This device is targeted at 3D printing. You could load Clipper on it and use it as a main control board. Most 3D printers, like my Ender 3 V2, have a decent little display, but like this one, it's usually not a touchscreen, and it's a lot smaller than 5 inches. Heck, using this thing, I could even run Octoprint directly on it so I wouldn't even need a separate Pi. But it's not only for 3D printers. You could integrate this into a custom car head unit for CarPlay or Android Auto, or put it anywhere you want a small, fast touchscreen computer. Big Tree Tech even provides a standalone 3D printed case design for the Raspberry Pad 5, so I went ahead and printed it. One side is all screen, but flipping it over, you can see all the I.O. On one side, the 40 GPIO pins and screen orientation and brightness controls, then the micro SD and two USB ports. Then there's USB-C for power input, HDMI 2.0, and another USB. And on the last side, a gigabit Ethernet jack. There's also a boot mode switch and a CSI camera port hidden on the top edge. The box also includes a USB-A to USB-C cable and all the screws to mount up the board in different scenarios. I'm going to install this little Compute Module 4 Lite model, and I just need to line up the board to board connectors and push until it pops in. Since it's a Lite module, I need a separate micro SD card and I'll stick Raspberry Pi OS on it. The card goes in the slot over here, but I have to leave it out for now so I can install the board in the case. And to make sure the built-in clock can keep time, I'll also install a little 1220 coin cell battery here. And before I put the board in, I gotta do the peel. And now that display looks really shiny. Too bad it'll never be this clean again. Now we just need to pop the whole assembly into the shell of the case, making sure the boot mode switch is the first thing I insert since it sticks out from the board a little bit. Once it's popped in, I can pop on the back cover. Now, I could put some screws in, but I'll put that off for now and just look around at how the case all fits together. And it's pretty darn precise. Some 3D printed designs leave a lot more tolerance, but this one is pretty close already. I did notice I can't press some of the buttons without a tool or a pencil. These screen brightness controls are just too small for me to comfortably press with my finger or even a fingernail. I loaded Raspberry Pi OS on the micro SD card, stuck it in the board, then plugged in power, ethernet, and HDMI and booted it up. Just like any other Pi, I could see output on my monitor, and I could also start using my keyboard and mouse plugged in via USB. But the internal display wasn't active yet. For that, you need to download a special DTB file to the Pi from Raspberry Pi's website. I did that using this command, then rebooted the Pi. After it booted up, the internal screen was active and working without any other drivers. I unplugged the external HDMI monitor, and the Pi automatically switched the main screen over to the Raspberry Pad. The screen itself was surprisingly sharp and has great viewing angles. It's not retina or high DPI resolution, but it's readable, and I didn't have to tweak any settings. The colors are vibrant, and unlike some cheaper Pi displays, I can see everything well even at pretty severe angles. The touchscreen controls all worked great, and I didn't need to do any calibration for that. The display brightness controls also work without any extra drivers, though there was a very quiet coil whine when I had the display less than full brightness. And the screen orientation button in the middle rotates the screen 180 degrees, which is handy if you need to mount the Raspberry Pad in a different orientation due to the port layout or something like that. So yeah, better than expected. At 99 bucks plus the cost of a compute module, it's not the cheapest touchscreen available, but it's the best 5-inch touchscreen I've tested on a Raspberry Pi. Speaking of touchscreen controllers using the Compute Module 4, the Re-Terminal is like a more refined version of the Raspberry Pad 5. 
It's double the price at 195 bucks, but it also has about double the functionality crammed into a nice molded enclosure. I talked about it a bit last year, but it's meant to be an HMI or human machine interface. The idea is you build a custom interface for it and it can integrate with a process or a machine in a factory or display important information that might need to be monitored and acted on. Seed's been selling it for a while now, but it's just another example of the tiny but powerful touchscreen computers you can build with the CM4. The Compute Module 4 can also make a powerful little network router these days, assuming you don't need more than a gigabit of bandwidth. OpenWRT is being used for routers like the DF Robot router board and Seed's router board, which I covered in my two tiny routers video last year. One additional feature I was hoping for in a custom router board was integrated 4G or 5G and WaveShare delivered with this. This is the $60 dual gigabit Ethernet 5G 4G baseboard, and I bought it with this metal enclosure. My plan is to build a custom router with a built-in 4G LTE modem for backup in case my cable internet goes down. Once I pop the board out, you can see on the back it has a coin battery holder for the real-time clock, plus micro SD and nano SIM card trays. Flipping it over reveals a ton of functionality. Besides the Compute Module 4, you can install an M.2 card for 4G or 5G internet. The port side has two gigabit ethernet ports, two HDMI ports, two USB 3 ports, and USB-C power input. Back on the top, there's also two CSI camera connectors and a DSI display connector, 40 pin GPIO, a boot select switch, and some status LEDs for power, activity, and cellular activity. Let's assemble the router and see what we can do with it. First, I'll pop a Compute Module 4 on top. Easy enough, just like all the other boards. Then I'll grab this Sierra Wireless Air Prime 4G modem. I haven't used this one yet. The other 4G modems I've used are Quectel modems that use Mini PCI Express. This modem uses an M.2 B key connector and supposedly delivers CAT 12 speeds up to 600 megabits down and 150 up. It's on the pricier end of 4G modems and I got mine used for about 110 bucks on eBay. The case kit comes with a little 12 volt PWM fan, so I installed that into the outer shell and plugged it into the board. Since the 4G card needs a wireless signal, and the metal case is really good at blocking wireless signals, I also needed to buy a couple antennas. They thread onto the case here, and the tiny little MHF 4 connector plugs into the card. I just plugged in the main and aux antenna, but there's also an extra port for GPS if I want to use that. The case has four antenna holes, so you could add on a GPS antenna and even a Wi-Fi antenna if your compute module has Wi-Fi built in, but I'll leave those other two holes closed for now. Next up, I loaded Raspberry Pi OS onto a micro SD card, popped that into the board, and booted it up. It's nice having an HDMI port on the router, and it makes debugging a lot simpler since you can see the display output even if you can't connect over the network for some reason. And first things first, the 12 volt PWM fan doesn't actually work as a PWM fan out of the box, it just stays on full blast, and at that speed it's a little bit loud and annoying. So I followed the advice on the WaveShare wiki and installed the CM4 IO fan software, and that controls PDM using Linux's hardware sensor controls, which is really nice. I cover how that works more in a blog post on my website, and it works with the fan controller on most Compute Module 4 boards. With PWM, the fan is almost silent at idle, and it just makes a tiny whine when ramped up during a stress NG run. I'm going to try to build a custom OpenWRT image for this board, one that can use the 4G modem and both Ethernet interfaces, but that'll be for a future video. For now, I wanted to see if I could get the 4G modem working at all, and also test the Ethernet ports to see if running over USB bottlenecks that second port. So I checked the website for the 4G card, and after some research, it looks like I'll actually have to compile the driver for the modem before I can use it. So I'll leave that for the future video. For the Ethernet ports, I plugged into each one separately and ran an iPerf3 test. For the built-in port, I was able to get about 140,000 packets per second. I got over 900 megabits per second up and 800 down when testing the full duplex gigabit connection. On the second port, the one that uses a USB Realtek RTL8153, I could only get about 100,000 packets per second with 940 megabits up, but only 200 down when measuring the full duplex performance. So there's definitely a bottleneck on the Ethernet port that goes over USB. How much that affects your use of the board will depend on what you want to use it for. Just like the Seed Studios router board I tested last year, it's still fast, but it's not going to be able to route at a full gigabit like you could with the DF Robot board. If you want to see how I get along with OpenWRT and the 4G modem on this thing, subscribe. Now, this next device is made by the home automation startup ABLog in Russia. It's the RPi4 RTC PoE 
and it has the most functionality I've ever seen crammed into a compact DIN rail computer. This thing has a lot inside it, and we'll get to that in a minute. But from the outside, you can see a bunch of activity LEDs right on the front along with a reset button. On the bottom, there are breakouts for power, the DALI 2 lighting control interface, and RS-485. Just above that is an antenna connector for the wireless Zigbee radio that's built in. Looking at the top, there's an Ethernet port under two USB 2 ports, and that Ethernet port also accepts power, and it's actually the only way to plug in and power this unit. Now over on the back, there's a DIN rail mount, so you can install this thing in any standard DIN rail. Now, getting inside is a little tricky. Everything is friction fit together with snaps, but it's a really solid enclosure. Popping off the front panel, there's actually a little Wi-Fi antenna that comes out of the box disconnected. You can connect it and switch the Pi's internal antenna over to it if you want. Then, popping off the back cover, you can see on the inside, the PCBs are actually soldered directly to each other at a 90 degree angle to save space. And wow, there is just not much more room to spare in here. There's a giant copper heatsink on the side with a pretty thick thermal pad pressing against the compute module's processor. And flipping it over, you can see the internal antenna connection for the Zigbee radio. And then if I jimmy it a bit, I can get the whole assembly to slide out the plastic enclosure, and here it is. There's a big sheet of thin copper to dissipate heat, but since the enclosure is plastic, the pie in here will probably throttle if you push it for a while, but the heatsink should at least keep the pie going during short bursts of activity. Besides the heatsink, there is a lot going on in this tiny computer. On one side, there's the Compute Module 4 and an integrated real-time clock and battery. Then on the other side, there's an NVMe SSD stacked on top of the Zigbee radio chip next to the ports. Let's pop off that NVMe drive to get a better look at the radio. It's an RF Star 2652 and it supports both Zigbee and Bluetooth. Interesting. On the board that's mounted at 90 degrees, there's all the PoE circuitry for power and when I popped off the Compute Module 4, I half expected to see some other feature hiding out underneath, but no, just some board traces. Whew, let's put this thing back together and see if I can get the seams to be as perfect as they were when I got it. <laughs> no, well, it's pretty close though. I popped it on my DIN rail, plugged in a cable back to my PoE switch, and it lit up right away and booted into PyOS. I logged in over SSH, and sure enough, it's set to boot off the NVMe SSD, and it's a fast but modestly fast Keoxia drive. But here's where the story gets a little sad. I've been wanting to do a full review and compare this little device and the whole Mega D ecosystem to the Home Assistant Yellow I tested last year, but when I started testing it, I got an alert the product page was missing from Tindy and I found out it's yet another casualty of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Since Tindy is owned by Siemens and they've stopped all business in Russia, Tindy removed all Russian sellers from its site. And Andre, who makes the ABLog home automation products, is Russian, so his store was taken down too. I think this is a brilliant design, and just like many other great little devices made by individuals and small startups in Russia, I hope Putin's war doesn't set back the clock so far that we see all these great products and new ideas just completely disappear. So right now, it's even harder to get one of these DIN rail computers than a Compute Module 4, and so far the Home Assistant Yellow seems to also be delayed. But there's another new board I haven't tested yet. Kinconi's KC868 Home Automation Server. You can go to the link in the description to read up on it, but maybe that board will be available sooner, who knows. Speaking of promising projects that might or might not ever be available, I've been tracking more and more of them. First, there's the Pocket, a truly modular computer based around the Compute Module 4. I hope to get one to test later this year, so subscribe for that, but it's a really interesting blend of software and snap together hardware that could make for a very flexible development platform. There's a really cool demo of the Pocket on YouTube, and I linked to it in the description. Check that out for more info. I also recently learned the MNT Reform, an open hardware laptop funded through CrowdSupply, will support the Compute Module 4 using their new RCM4 adapter. The adapter should also be compatible with Pine64's SO quartz. And I always have my eyes open for cool new retro gaming builds with the CM4, and this month, the newest one is the PS Pi Compute, which is a special board to adapt a Compute Module 4 into a PSP shell, breathing new life into these old devices. And right now, it looks like the production of that board is on hold from the chip shortage too, but it'll be great to see if it ever actually launches. 
If you made it this far in the video, you're probably wanting to know what's coming up next. Well, make sure you're subscribed because you don't want to miss a video coming up on the Raspberry Shake and Citizen Science with Raspberry Pis, or my next GPU update. That's right, I got this little guy working on the Compute Module 4. I'm also experimenting with Discord. Patreon supporters already have access, so go check out my Patreon if you want to see more of this stuff. And I'm hoping to get all my GitHub sponsors in there soon too. Also, check out Gearling Engineering, my second channel, where my dad and I are working on some fun projects around a radio studio. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.